Hey guys, welcome back to another lecture video for Chem 104. In this lecture video, we are going to learn how to convert Fisher projections into Haworth structures or Haworth projections. We're going to go ahead and apply this to monosaccharides. And if you guys recall from um, earlier lecture videos, monosaccharides comes in two flavors. They're either aldoses or ketoses. And so we're going to go ahead and, and learn the general rules, and then we're going to go ahead and uh, look at very specific examples so that you guys know how to properly convert uh, Fisher projections for aldoses and ketoses into Haworth structures. And so um, up to now, we've actually been treating, or I've been treating, um, carbohydrates as uh, linear structures. Um, and so it turns out that Carbohydrates that have four carbons or more in its uh, chain um, tend to adopt a more cyclic conformation uh, just because it's more thermodynamically stable. And so what that generally means is that the cyclic conformation has a lower energy to it. So therefore, it's more thermodynamically stable. Um, so I wouldn't really focus on that uh, idea or the term of something that's being thermodynamically stable. Just understand that if you guys have like, you know, a, a carbohydrate with like five or six um, carbons in its chain, and then, uh, so you're gonna take that linear structure, you're gonna put it in water, and what happens is that those, that molecule is going to kind of articulate in such a way that it forms a cyclic ring. And that cyclic ring, that specific conformation, is just much more stable than something that's linear. Um, and so on the left side of this, this image right here, this is uh, an example of a Fisher projection, which is something that we learned in the previous lecture video. Um, and so this Haworth projection or Haworth structure that I keep alluding to basically looks like this. And so it turns out that there are many ways to uh, represent cyclic structures for carbohydrates. The Haworth projection is one of them, but not the only way to represent a, a cyclic carbohydrate. If this was the full year of organic chemistry, um, then we would then we would uh, learn how to to draw the chair conformation for this glucose ring. Last but not least, um, we, can always, we can also represent a cyclic conformation using our skeletal structural de depiction. So this is known as a bond angle drawing. Um, the only difference is that we're letting the readers know how those hydroxyls are placed in three-dimensional space, whether or not they're, they're uh, behind the plane or they're above the plane boulder dash lines. All right. Um, and so let's go ahead and zoom in on the Haworth projection. So the Haworth projection or the Haworth structure tends to look like this. Um, so this is the end product that we're trying to keep in mind, but not all carbohydrates will look exactly like this, uh, just because it depends on the number of of carbons that chain has, in addition, whether or not if it's an aldose or a ketose. And so on the left-hand side, um, this is a Fisher projection of D-glucose. So D is representing a very specific stereoisomer of this carbohydrate. And that's um, that was determined by how this hydroxyl is placed on the last anomeric carbon, which is on the fifth carbon. Um, and so since this hydroxyl group is on the right, then this would be D-glucose. All right, so uh, once again, we're going to learn how to convert from a Fisher projection into a Haworth projection. But before we do so, I wanna go ahead and talk about um, some characteristic features of the Haworth structure or Haworth projection. And so the main goal is to represent um, this cyclic carbohydrate as something that's three-dimensional. 
Um, and so I want you guys to imagine that you guys have a um, hexagon uh, right in front of you, and it's flat, very similar to how you guys are seeing it on the screen. Um, and you guys are going to lay that flat hexagon. Um, uh, imagine that it's like a tile that like kids play when they learn, you know, shapes or something like that, right? Um, so you're going to take this, this uh, wooden colored hexagon tile, you're going to place it flat on your desk, and then you yourself, you're going to stand up and then kind of crouch down so that your eye level, um, so that your eye is in level with the edge of the tile, the hexagon tile. And so what you guys are basically seeing, if you followed my description, um, is this portion right here. So uh, this whole thing is the hexagon tile that I was alluding to. Um, and when you guys place it face down on a desk such that your eye level is in, is in the same uh, line of sight, so to speak, as the edge of that, that hexagon tile, what you're seeing is the edge of this hexagon tile. And so since that edge is um, protruding more or less towards you, you're going to represent it as a bold line. Um, another way to kind of think about this is imagining that there's a plane, right? Um, so I'm, I'm simply going to take this hexagon, I'm going to cut it in half, um, but not like physically. I'm just imagining that there's a plane that cuts this hexagon in half. And so I want you guys to notice that the front part is um, in front of the plane, right? So this, this piece that I'm circling is in front of that uh, line. And so therefore, we're going to represent the covalent bonds as something that's bold, meaning that it's, it's it's pointing towards you. Um, for the other covalent bonds that is behind the blue line or behind the plane, instead of representing it as a dashed line, we're just going to go ahead and represent it as a normal line. Um, the reason why is, is it's kind of cumbersome to draw like a whole bunch of dashes, right? Um, some dashes are very inconsistent, and it takes a long time for us to draw a whole bunch of dashed lines. And so instead of drawing dashed lines, um, we're just going to represent it as a normal line, but it's kind of like this unsaid uh, rule or unsaid thing that these normal lines for the Hawar structures are behind the plane, behind that blue line. And so... You know, in short, um, this Hallwer structure is supposed to represent the three-dimensional character of a carbohydrate. Now, the other thing that I want to mention is um, the representation of the hydrogens. And so, if you guys recall, when you're drawing the skeletal structure, you typically don't draw in your hydrogens. You just, uh, you know, draw the covalent bonds that are between two carbons, two or more carbons. Um, however, for the Haworth structure, the hydrogens must be represented. And so because these hydrogens must be represented, we need to know how many hydrogens we're going to have to write for each of the uh, carbon that we see on this ring. Um, and so let me take a step back real quick. So everything that I'm highlighting here in pink, the, the, ver the vertices, corners, etc., those are all representing carbons, right? Very similar to our skeletal structure, very similar to our um, Fisher projection, right? So all of these are carbons. And so because carbons are tetrahedral um, and they want their octet, to be filled, we need to make sure that we have uh, four bonds um, around each carbon on this ring. And so here we have one, 
two, three. And so it turns out that we need one more. Um, we need one more covalent bond to make carbon number one have the full octet. And so um, there's many different ways for you guys to draw this hydrogen. You guys can draw it like this, you can draw it like this, you can draw it like this, whatever, whatever, whatever. Uh, for Haworth structures, um, it's actually much more prescriptive. And, and so for the Haworth structures, we are actually going to draw that hydrogen um, completely opposite uh, to the hydroxyl group. And so if the hydroxyl group is pointing down, then that means that the hydrogen must point up. Okay. So we're, we're simply representing um, the covalent bonds between hydrogen and hydroxyl as like this, this long extended um, uh, line. Okay. And so if we're looking at carbon 2, since the hydroxyl is pointing down, then that means that the hydrogen is going to point up. And so if we count the number of carbon or number of bonds around the carbon around carbon number two, we have one, two, three, four carbons. Or sorry, oh, one, four bonds. Um, and so since we have four bonds and we know that carbon has fulfilled its octet, here we have one, two, three, three covalent bonds. And so that means we need one more. And since hydroxyl is going to is placed at the top. We're going to draw a vertical line going down, and then we're going to place our hydrogen. And so for carbon number four, notice our, our hydroxyl group is uh, is down, and so it's below the the it's below the um, the carbohydrate, below the plane of the carbon carbohydrate, and so that means that our hydrogen is going to be pointed up. And so on carbon number five here, we have one two, three covalent bonds. And so that means we need one more covalent bond that's going to be filled in with a hydrogen to make sure that that carbon, carbon number five, has fulfilled, has filled its octet. Okay. Um, and so uh, this is basically how you guys would, would draw your final um, Haworth structure. And so let me talk about oxygen and uh, let me just go ahead and talk about oxygen right now. So remember that oxygen um, needs to also follow its octet rule. Um, and so if we count the number of bonds, we have one, two bonds, right? And so uh, that's four electrons. So in other words, this oxygen needs four more electrons. If you guys recall the uh, Lewis dot structure for oxygen, Oxygen has six valence electrons, so there's one, two, three, four, five, and six. So oxygen will always naturally have two lone pairs. And so we're going to go ahead and place those two lone pairs on the structure to represent the full octet for that oxygen. Now these uh, single electrons are going to participate in you know, the covalent the formation of the covalent bond so that the oxygen can fulfill its octet rule. Okay. All right. And so um, just to kind of drive home the point, um, you know, that the bond that's on the left for in, with respect to the oxygen is kind of lined up to carbon number five, right? Uh, and so the same idea can be said for this electron over here. Oh, well, you guys got the idea. Um, okay. And so for the Haworth structure, um, for, oops, car for carbon number six, your, uh, for, for this example, um, your carbon number six is always going to point up and so it turns out that all anomeric, car I'm sorry, not anomeric, all chiral carbons in 
um, the Fisher for projection are found on the the ring of the Haworth structure. All right, so what do I mean by this? Um, and so if you guys look at carbon number, oops. And so if you guys look at carbon number two, and we'll talk about carbon number one. Um, carbon number one is very special. But if you guys look at carbon number two, notice that we have the vertical line intersecting with that horizontal line in the Fisher projection. So this lets us know that carbon two, three, four, and five are all chiral carbons. And so if you look at their position um, in the Haworth structure, carbon two is a vertice on the ring, carbon three is a vertice on the ring, carbon four is a vertice on the ring, carbon number five is a vertice on the ring. Because carbon number six has uh, um, two hydrogens bonded to that carbon, it is this carbon is going to be achiral. Is this bonded to two uh, of the, of the same thing, right? Um, and so since carbon number six is a chiral, we're going to represent, we're going to make sure that that a chiral carbon is, uh, is pointing up. Okay. All right. So um, we'll talk about carbon number one. Um, so carbon number one is known as the anomeric carbon. Um, and the anomeric carbon is, is going to be part of the ring, even though it's not chiral. Uh, we'll see why in just a few moments. And so these are pretty much the main features of the Haworth structure, the Haworth projection, that I would like you guys to kind of keep in mind. All right, so we're going to go ahead and skip this slide. I'll show you guys that mechanism, the formation of the hemiacetal uh, in just a few moments, but... Basically, it's a reaction between an aldehyde and an alcohol, and we'll look at that mechanism in just a second. All right, so the first thing that we're going to do, um, now that we've kind of seen the beginning and the end product, uh, the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to learn the, the, the specific steps on how to draw the um, Haworth structure from the Fisher projection. And so the first few examples is just going to focus on aldoses. And so if you guys recall, aldoses or ald is reminiscent of aldehyde. And so we have a carbohydrate that has an aldehyde in its functional group. And that aldehyde is going to be represented by CHO, right? So CHO um, in its condensed structure form. All right, so the first step, much like what you guys are seeing on the screen, is to rotate your Fisher projection um, uh, 90 degrees to the right. Okay. So in other words, if you treat this D-glucose, this Fisher projection of D-glucose, as a human being, and if you imagine that the um, aldehyde is the head of that structure, you're just going to kind of um, put, it, put it to bed, so to speak. And so um, you guys are always going to rotate um, the D-glucose or the Fisher projection 90 degrees to the right. So you're going clockwise. Do not uh, invert it to the left. So don't do counterclockwise. Um, okay. All right. And so now that we've uh, kind of laid this guy kind of flat, um, we're going to try to imitate the um, hexagon type feature for uh, this D-glucose, much like what you guys saw at the very, very beginning. And so this idea of twisting our 
um, our Fisher projection to create this this uh, reminiscent structure of, of a hexagon. Um, typically, have students um, struggling ish, and and we'll go. I'll go over on how I do it personally, so you guys will see it. But let me just talk about it for now. So, if you guys are looking at um, the Haworth structure or this precursor to the Haworth structure, notice that the focal point for a six carbon carbohydrate is on carbon two and carbon three. So carbon two and carbon three are like really, really in front of, uh, of um, they're, it's, it's coming towards you, it's pointing towards you. And so once again, if you uh, place a blue line horizontal, so this, this blue line that I'm drawing, so to speak, is going to be the imaginary plane um, carbon 2 and carbon 3 are kind of like the focal point for the front part of that um, precursor of the hexagon. And so I'm going to go ahead and highlight this section right here. Okay, So this is going to be our reference point, if you will. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take carbon 1 and carbon 2 and we're going to articulate this upwards, much like you guys see here. And then we're going to take carbon 3 and carbon 4, and we're going to take this whole structure, and we're going to articulate it um, up so that it kind of looks like this. Okay. And so now that you've kind of bent um, carbon 3 and carbon 4, you're going to go ahead and create another bend between carbon four, and, oh, carbon four and carbon five, much like you guys see here. And since carbon six is an achiral carbon, um, that six carbon is always going to be pointing up. And so overall, you get this um, semi precursor to the Haworth structure. Uh, now, I do want you guys to note um, that th the way that this Fisher projection was was made was, you know, drawing in all of the carbons. Um, and so this is carbon 1, carbon 2, carbon 3, carbon 4, carbon 5, carbon 6. And so it's very, very important for you guys to um, identify where your carbons are with respect to the Fisher projection, to that of the Haworth, um, because it really does dictate how your final structure will, will look like. Um, and we'll go through those motions once again when we go over these, uh, when, when we go over a couple of examples. All right, so we are at this point in drawing our Haworth structure. Um, so at this very specific point, what I want to do is be, to be able to um, create a full ring. And for me to have a full ring, I need to perform a specific reaction. I need to form a covalent bond between carbon one and oxygen. Okay. Now I just can't draw um, a covalent bond I have to have a reason. There has to be some type of justification for the formation of that covalent bond between oxygen and carbon number one. Okay. Um, and so before I start, I want you guys to note that this aldehyde <clears throat> is trigonal planar, right? So uh, CO, okay. So this aldehyde is trigonal planar. Um, its bond angle is 120 degrees. And the reason why I bring this up is f to serve as a reminder that at this point in time, this guy is flat. Okay? It's in the same plane as all of the other carbons in that ring. And so um, to 
form that covalent bond between oxygen and carbon, remember that oxygen has those two lone pairs. And so what's going to happen is uh, this one of these lone pairs, it doesn't matter if it's the lone pair at the top or the bottom, it is going to donate that lone pair to carbon. Um, and so once it donates that, that lone pair to carbon, then that means it's sharing that these two electrons that have circled is being shared between oxygen and carbon. And the sharing of the oxygen and the carbon creates a covalent bond in which the end of that covalent bond is representing those two lone pairs. Or I'm sorry, those two electrons in the lone pair. Now there's a problem with this specific mechanism. If you guys count, uh, we have one, two, three, four, five bonds on carbon. And so you guys, that, that, that cannot occur because carbons, uh, they must follow the octet rule. And so what's going to happen is that this double bond is going to go to oxygen. Okay. And I'm going to go ahead and show my work just a little bit more. Uh, remember that oxygens, they always naturally have that lone pair, those two lone pairs. So there's actually two invisible lone pairs that I haven't like really drawn in, but I need to draw in now. And so what's going to happen is that uh, these two electrons, maybe I should just do this in a different color. So these two electrons um, that form that double bond is going to go back to oxygen. And um, what you guys are going to get is this It's this uh, confirmation, if you will, um, where this oxygen is going to be negative because it gained an extra electron. Um, and this oxygen is going to be positive. Right? Um, and so you guys can count the formal charges and you guys would see that this oxygen is going to be positive one. And so oxygens don't really like to be positive. They like to be uh, negative, if you will, because it's a highly electronegative atom. And so what's going to happen is that to balance things out, um, that lone pair is going to kind of take the hydrogen from the oxygen. And that bond that's between the oxygen and this hydrogen is going to go back to oxygen. Okay. And so the resulting product, let me just kind of copy and paste this here. And so when the oxygen takes that hydrogen from the oxygen with a positive charge, then this bond gets destroyed. Um, because it goes back to the oxygen with a positive charge. And that hydrogen is going to kind of snap into, snap back so that it can join this oxygen. So what we're going to do is we're going to erase this and we're going to take away that one lone pair and then we're just going to put in a covalent bond with hydrogen. So overall, if I were to kind of put these uh, elements together, we get a hydroxyl group. And so this is um, the, the hemiacetal that that previous lecture slide that I was showing you kind of demonstrates. And so whenever you have an aldehyde with reacting with an alcohol, you form a hemiacetal. So it's a little um, 
different in terms of depiction uh, with what you guys are seeing on this screen to what I kind of drew over here. But um, trust me when I say this, uh, this area right here is going to be your hemiacetal. Um, and those two lone pairs, actually I should write them in blue, not, not pink. So these two lone pairs on the oxygen is still found. Okay. Um, and so we have this concerted reaction, if you will, this, uh, hopping, this, this, this continuous, um, exchange of electrons. Um, so that the final structure not only follows the octet rule, um, but the, the final conformation of that structure is thermodynamically stable. Okay. Um, and so one more thing that I want to mention, and it's the reason why this is known as an anomeric carbon, why carbon number one, the carbonyl carbon is known as an anomeric carbon. And so remember earlier, I'm going to go ahead and erase this stuff. So remember earlier, I mentioned that this aldehyde is trigonal planar, that means it's flat. But once this covalent bond is formed, this carbon is no longer trigonal planar, this carbon is now tetrahedral. And so what that means is that this hydrogen is not going to be in plane with the carbon. It's either going to point up or point down. Now, the, um, if you guys kind of think about it, um, that hydrogen can either point up or point down with respect to this hydroxyl that's being made. Um, there's really nothing steering this hydrogen from specifically going up or down. Um, and so it can do both is basically what I'm getting at. And so because this carbonyl carbon was originally trigonal planar, and the transformation of the trigonal planar into a tetrahedral, it will force this hydrogen, this hydroxyl group, to conform to a specific three-dimensional shape. It's no longer going to be in plane. And so we're going to denote the orientation of the hydrogen and the, the OH, excuse me, as either alpha or beta, to represent whether or not that hydrogen is pointing up or that hydrogen is pointing down. And so uh, you guys can um, just use either reference point, either this hydrogen or this hydroxyl group. Um, so alpha um, is going to have the hydrogen pointing up and the hydroxyl group pointing down. And so this, this alpha is representing the uh, conformation of that hydrogen of the anomeric carbon. And so the carbonyl carbon, once the hemiacetal is formed, is now known as the anomeric carbon. Okay, so that's its formal technical name. So when it was an aldehyde, it was a carbonyl carbon. Now as a, a Haworth structure, it's going to be known as a um, anomeric carbon. And so if you guys look at beta D glucose, notice that your beta represents the hydroxyl pointing up and your hydrogen pointing down. Okay. And your anomeric carbon will always be the carbon that's adjacent to the oxygen. It cannot be um, this, it cannot be this carbon because if you look at the what's attached to carbon number five, you have your tail end, you have your, your um, achiral carbon. Um, and so when you guys are drawing this, uh, just kind of keep in mind this, this achiral carbon as your, as your reference point. 
um, so your anomeric carbon is always the carbon that just has the hydroxyl group. Um, and it can either be, it's typically found on the right-hand side of the oxygen, um, not the left-hand side of the oxygen. Okay. Um, and so basically this slide is, is just showing what, what I've kind of drawn up here, the, all those crazy arrows that I was um, drawing. Um, and so this, once again, this lone pair is going to form a covalent bond. Um, and because those carbons want to have, because those carbons want to follow the octet rule, then there's going to be a whole bunch of rearrangement that occurs where this double bond goes back to this oxygen. And then this, this uh, extra lone pair on the oxygen is going to take the hydrogen from that oxygen. Um, and it's going to keep doing that until it forms a hemiacetal. Um, and that would be our final structure. Okay. Um, and so uh, once you guys have connected your hydrogens, um, I'm sorry, once you guys have connected your, your uh, alcohol, in, from the last anomeric carbon to the carbonyl carbon, and then transformed your your aldehyde into an alcohol, and then you guys have your um, Haworth projection. And once again, this is just a summary of this uh, idea um, that the hydrogen and the hydroxyl group on the anomeric carbon can either point up or point down. Um, and once again, this is because the aldehyde is trigonal planar, so it's originally flat. And then converting the trigonal planar into tetrahedral, uh, forces the hydrogen and the OH to kind of take a specific side. Um, it can't be in the same plane as the ring. And so if your OH is pointing down, um, then that's alpha. If your OH is pointing up, then that's beta. Okay. All right, so what we're gonna do is um, we are going 